Right. So, um, again, thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope you get uh, a lot out of today. Um, yes, we do have the protocols relating to mesotherapy, peels, needling and LED. But what we're going to do is initially start with the preemption to anything that involves aesthetic practice. So we need to understand the basics before we move on to actually understanding the protocols themselves. So what we're going to do is basically we've got the four of them at the moment. So mesotherapy, we have 40 years of clinical evidential research, thousands of years being used throughout the world. With needling, originally a subcision, medical starting point for thousands of years too, think of acupuncture. Peels, the oldest form of regeneration, over 3,000 years. Simply put, these three treatments have over 3,000 years of history, research and development. What further proof of their effectiveness could you ask for? And that's really important. Clinically, in my world especially, I can't use anything unless I know that there's historical data evidence, which would include trials, white papers, independent trials especially, um, to know where we're going and that we have confidence not only in the treatment, but the results themselves. And these three put together, we pretty much nailed it. There are lots and lots of myths, myths and misconceptions out there surrounding pretty much every aesthetic treatment. <laughs> Um, and again, I'm not being uh, rude, but a lot of it's based on branded treatments or companies that are creating something um, and no disrespect to them because everyone needs to make money and that's brilliant. However, it does confuse the issue slightly and it muddies the waters. So first and foremost, do you peel first and why? 100%. And by the end of this, you'll under, I'll give you a little bit more detail as, as to why. But yes, without question, you peel before any treatment. Um, do you always use a mesotherapy cocktail during needling? This is a bit of a thing for me. Um, I get a bit bent out of shape for this. No. Um, again, we'll, we'll touch on it. But mesotherapy and medical needling are two entirely different protocols. The combination of the two doesn't exist unless you're implanting something into the skin incredibly superficially. Needling and mesotherapy have to remain separate, but I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, I've just told you that, <laughs> the difference between the two of them. Basically one is collagen induction to promote a wound of some description. Mesotherapy is to implant various natural ingredients to kickstart um, hemostasis or collagen induction from a different way. It's more about skin health, um, and the 360 approach. When and why would I combine them? We'll get to that later. And don't follow trends, follow evidence. That I, it's a, a really important thing right there. Uh, just as a throw away there, that if you, if you do have people coming to you or different protocols or different products or whatever, that's the first thing you should ask for. And um, what's the evidence? What's the backstory? And um, do you have trials that back it up? Um, you really need to ask that question. As I said, yeah, so independent trials and, and product efficiency. Now, what are combination treatments? So, stepping back slightly, combination treatments are amazing. All of them individually are phenomenal. However, we need to understand why we're going to do them, in what order we're going to do them, and do we actually have to do them? So, in that situation, we need to understand, first of all, the condition that the person is showing, the target, which would be a, a myriad of different things, and the result. So you look at those three before you even make a decision as to what you're doing, because that will make the huge difference. The specific treatment is targeting today, tomorrow, and long term. You need to explain the importance of the continued aftercare, diagnose the condition, find the solution. So I step back before I do anything and work out where we need to get to and how we can get to that specific treatment or condition that they're showing. Um, and again, we'll touch on that in a second. Now, this is, this is for those of you who know me, this is where I get all like um, obsessed. This is, this is my passion. So our skin, the largest and most complex organ, absolutely. Now, this is something I brought to my own clinical work relatively recently because we know that out there a lot of clients especially are just are out for instant gratification 
Now, instant gratification in skincare does not work. The only thing that works with instant gratification would be filler, which of course is amazing, but it's short term and it doesn't do anything in relationship to skin health or maintenance. Toxin, as we know, two weeks, but once again, it's short lived. So we need to work at it from an organ. So when these clients are coming to me and I can tell that they are out for instant gratification or they basically say, make me 10 years younger, we've all heard that a million times. So what I say is, okay, let's make this really simple for you. If you went to see your cardiologist and with a heart condition of some description, and he says to you, okay, now you need to go on this particular medication and you used to exercise for the next six months. This is your dietary sheet and come back and see me in six months and we'll, we'll readdress. Would you argue with that, that consultant? Of course they say no. And my response to that is, well, you're arguing with me. The skin is an organ, an organ that people forget. It's an organ that is visual, is the only organ that shows you what's wrong with it. But it's the one organ that we just kind of totally take for granted, especially the general public. So I'm like, okay, so you won't, you won't tell off the cardiologist, but you're, you're telling me. So it will take as long for me to fix the condition that you are showing right now, obviously dependent on what they're showing, um, as it would do for various other medical conditions. And then they go, oh my God, I never thought of it that way. And suddenly they, you, you've got their interest in the response that you are being 100% correct. You're being histological from a medical perspective. You're telling them exactly what's going on and how you can get there. And believe me, you can get there but it will take a bit of time because we have a regenerative organ here that needs time to fix itself. Now, this is quite amazing. And I also tell people this um, in clinic, which is every square centimetre of your skin, which is about the size of your small fingernail, contains 70 centimetres of blood vessels. It contains 55 centimetres of nerves. It contains 100 sweat glands, 15 oil glands, 230 sensory receptors and approximately half a million cells that are constantly dying and being replaced. That is pretty miraculous. When that's a, a single centimeter of your skin, you put that over the whole body, it's pretty amazing. As you start to understand skin's AMP more so, you can look at these things here and kind of work out what is actually going on with that person's condition by these guys here. If they're not working correctly, the communication isn't happening. Um, but we're, as I say, we're, we're working it from a, from a medical standpoint or from the organ itself standpoint. We know that the skin is phenomenally complicated, mind-blowingly complicated, but it's also incredibly lazy and it needs a bit of a smack on occasion to knock it into shape. But if you, if you smack it too much, it will come back and bite you, like pigmentation and various other things. Now, the great thing is with all the evidence that's coming out at the moment, and this isn't rocket science really when you think about it, but this has been around for the last probably five, 10 years or so, an awful lot of um, research based on this. So it's histological, biochemical, and biomolecular evidence has brought no understanding of skin cell function in relation to the aging process. And it is 100% intermolecular transport and communication. That's it in a nutshell. So everything we do in clinic, um, in aesthetics, has got everything to do with transport and communication. The ability for the cells to communicate to each other correctly. If they calm down, if they stop working, or if they go on holiday, things go wrong. So we need to make sure, understand which cells aren't working, which cells need a bit of help, support, and work with them. So the great thing about combination treatments, it's non-surgical. It's little or no downtime. There's rarely negative reactions and there's de detailed research and clinical evidence, which is amazing. So what we're looking for is a delivery and maintenance that will stimulate cell metabolism. Wonderful, which of course guilt by association will produce collagen and promote the body's circulatory lymphatic and immune systems, which will kickstart collagenesis and to create that, what I was looking for, that firmer or nourished skin. Now, this is a really important one because this is something that I didn't, it wasn't until I started writing um, the education platform that these things came through to me and it kind of blew my mind. 
um, this is touching on needling as well, in fact, everything. In most protocols, they always bang on about the fibroblast and bored hearing about that. Now, yes, the fibroblast produces the extracellular matrix and collagen, of course it does, amazing. But it also produces other things too, which we'll get to in a second. But when I'm talking about cellular communication, this is where it sits. So every one of these growth factors are incredibly important, very important. They are the, the managers, they are the, the conductor at the front of the orchestra who's, who's conducting all the various players in that orchestra. That's what they do. They basically have one job to do. Now, when we look at the fibroblast, it's now sitting about one to 1.5 into dermal tissue. That's quite deep. And back in the day, when we were doing very deep and aggressive needling treatments, that's what we were targeting, but it was unnecessary. With peels, back in the day, maybe 10 years ago, peels were extremely aggressive. And I was very gobby, shocker, um, about um, peels look, making the skin thinner and um, making it look kind of older in a way. But I couldn't work out why, I just used to say it a lot. And then ended up not doing peels anymore because they were too aggressive. Obviously, life's moved on now. But so when I wrote this, I went, oh my God, wow this is now making so much sense so here we go the dermal the derm, in the dermis we have the growth factors that are responsible for fibroblasts vascular and like rosacea vascular endothelial alopecia which is prp um, and transformer growth factor but in the epidermis the, the area that people take less notice of is the epidermal regeneration thickening of the entire epidermis and the keratinocyte is the cellular turnover, the proliferation of fibroblasts and keratinocytes. They are now my two best friends. So let's think about it simply. If those two are taken away, so again, communication, 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 if those two epidermal growth factors were taken away, what happens? Technically nothing, because the keratinocytes growth factor is responsible for the proliferation of fibroblasts and cellular turnover, it's its job to tell the, the growth factors sitting below it, i.e. in the dermis, what to do. So that turned everyone's world upside down when it came to both mesotherapy, medical needling, and to peels, all of them. Because rather than us causing a huge wound or too much drama in the skin, we are looking at the cells that are responsible for those specific jobs. Now, epidermal growth factor and keratinocyte growth factor are now my two best, best friends. They are the ones that make everything work. So this is what we, I look at too in relationship to the conditions that I am searching for. So if the person does have stretch marks, keloid, hypertrophic, um, contracture scarring, of course I'm gonna go straight down to the, the deepest possible, the platelet-derived growth factor, PRP, which is gonna kickstart our wound healing response, 100%. But if I want regeneration, collagen induction, um, that more sexier skin, thickening the epidermal tissue, I want epidermal growth factors. So suddenly it's, everything's moved quite dramatically over the last few years. Now the fibroblast, it's a clever little guy, a very clever little guy, as we know. Now, we know that it has to cons consistently uh, produce the collagen, elastin, and uh, hyaluronic acid. Or the extra matrix um, it does do that quite well of course but did you know that there are up to 20 different forms of fibroblast or collagen that the fibroblast produces now that's worrying because in aesthetics we only need two type one and type three if you overproduce the body is going the cell or the, the brain technically is going to go i've been wounded it's a bad one, I'm going to produce this collagen. And that collagen is going to be the wrong collagen for that specific wound healing response. And voila, you get fibrosis. You see it a lot. Um, so back earlier when I said the skin's lazy, it needs a bit of a slap occasionally, but it will come back and bite you. This is exactly what it will do. So we want to make the skin produce the collagen that it thinks it needs, not us telling it what it needs. It's a very different thing. It's much, much, much cleverer than us, and it will know what's going on. The wound healing response especially is in extremely complicated, 
and needs to be handled with kit gloves and understanding the response that you are trying to get out of it. So what, pro what production of collagen do you actually need for that specific area? Because you could get a smorgasbord of others that are going to be produced. As I stated, you can get fibrotic tissue and various other things. So um, the other thing too, which is uh, quite worrying in a way, that if it's constantly um, impaired, um, it doesn't work if, i.e. if it's traumatized consistently or there's massive amounts of inflammation, it doesn't work either. It impairs, it calms down. So it also means that the extreme, aggressive, angry treatments are technically on one side of the coin either not gonna work, or on the other side are gonna cause the wrong collagen, which would be fibrosis. Now we've all seen this, this picture, it's amazing. And this is it in a nutshell for me. If I'm in clinic, I actually look at this and kind of in my head work out what's going on and everything else. Now the other thing about the skin, which is obviously crazy complicated, is the fact that it doesn't have a blood supply to the superficial, super, superficial tissue, i.e. the epidermis. Um, and every organ has a blood supply to survive. The epidermis doesn't, the, or the skin doesn't, which is the largest organ. That's amazing. Um, but the other way of getting nutrients from our body, but apart from blood, is oxygen. So it feeds the most complicated process that the skin goes through, which is mitosis, which is the birth of a new cell, and that sits in the epidermal junction. So the epidermal junction is my favorite thing in the universe. It's the birth of everything. It's, the, it's just mind blowing what it does and that's where we tend to target a lot of our treatments in relationship to things like mesotherapy because that's where we're targeting or placing these ingredients um that's as an in vitro of or uh, the epidermis and dermis so you can see the difference between the two but we'll get that get to that a little bit later here it is so in treatment for the protocols that we're talking about tonight is we have papillary in the reticular dermis absolutely you can see the difference between the two the papillary dermis is, is much more loose connective tissue. The collagen is more free flowing. You can see the fibroblast right in there. And the reticular is totally different. That's the spot, it's more spongy, it's thicker. Um, we don't target that in a lot of aesthetics. That would be where you're replacing filler if you needed to get um, more construction. Now the epidermal junction is right there, of course. Um, and I, as I stated, that's the amazing part. That's the brand new cell. That's the stem cell. That's what we're looking for. We want to maintain the integrity of that as it works its way through the, the, the skin, through keratinization until we see it visually 28 uh, or so days later. So the stress and corneum will give us appearance and glow. That's easy. Superficial peel will remove the, the stress and corneum. It'll allow for that silky, sexy skin that people want. Um, with the good and the right peel, it will also help with um, uh, anti-aging pro properties as well, but we'll get to that in a second. But that one's easy, and that's one of the reasons why you should always peel first. The granulosum or spinosum is where the cellular turnover is. So this is now where we're looking at the keratocyte growth factor. Um, so once again, cellular turnover, people would already automatically jump on the bandwagon of a dermis, or they're going, why isn't it in the dermis? Well, because it doesn't need to be. And the stratum basal is skin tone, complexion, radiance, elasticity, firmness, and fibroblasts right there. So again, growth factor, growth factor, growth factor. So we now know that the result-orientated treatments are far more on the superficial plane than they are on the deep. Yes, there's a reason at certain points where deep is necessary, but not when it comes to more of a regenerative protocols and um, getting that person's skin back. Now this is, um, everyone loves this because it's like Disneyland. Um, the extracellular matrix, which is what we just looked at, uh, the, the dermis itself. So this is the extracellular matrix. And to make it really simple, because I am quite simple, I created this, which is a tropical fish tank. Now, I don't know loads about a tropical fish tank, but I do know that there is an enormous, enormous amount of life and support that's in that fish tank. So not just the fish, the water itself, the pH level of that water, all of the plant life, the marine life, everything that's going on in there, it's, a, it's huge. Think of that as the service of that being our skin barrier or our, our first line of defense. The tank bottom is muscle, we're not worried about that. Now, if we think about this fish tank's ecosystem or this matrix, what would happen 
if the pH of this fish tank changes dramatically, most of it will not survive. Maintenance of the excellent mantras is mandatory for our own ecosystem to function effectively. I know we aren't a fish tank, but it's not far off. Everything that sits inside that is a little bit like our extracellular matrix. We have to make sure that everything in there is working to its best. So all the vitamins, all the minerals, all the, the hyaluronic acid, all of this, uh, things are going, going beautifully. So when they start to uh, turn off, like if the various of the vitamins or the cells start to stop communicating, then of course things start to happen and we then start to see it visually down the line. So what we are trying to do is not only create a wound for collagen or to peel, but we are trying to put the ingredients back into the skin that our skin knows, understands, and accepts, and will kickstart its own regeneration of that particular product. So that's where mesotherapy sits in, kicks in. Now the skin barrier is, uh, we all know what this is, but unfortunately it's kind of missed out a little bit. Because basically, when we're looking at people's skin and you're, you're diagnosing it or you're doing your consultation, if someone has a compromised skin barrier, then there's, there's really little you can do about it. You actually really have to give them home care ingredients or, or possibly superficial peel would be okay for a short period of time, but maybe retinol or some hyaluronic acid serums of some description to kind of maintain and repair that barrier. Because if you're getting transepidermal water loss or you're gonna get any pathogens that are coming in, you're gonna cause, it's gonna cause a problem. And we want to make sure that that barrier is completely um, intact. Now, it, no one looks like this, the one on the left-hand side, that's you know the most mind-blowingly beautiful skin, but with the cells looking like a brick wall like they do, in between each one of those brick bricks has the lymph, uh, lymph has uh, extracellular cement, which is what it's usually known as. And that stops water from being released and it stops water from coming in. Incredible. To the right hand side, that is a compromised skin barrier. So those lipids are in trouble. So it's meaning that we can get things are starting to get in. Now you'll tend to find that people with eczema, psoriasis, extremely dry skin, irritated skin, clients will say to you, my skin's really sensitive. It's not, they just got a really compromised barrier. We need to put that back. So um, by doing that, we're preparing it, okay? Almost like a canvas, we're preparing that skin for what we are then going to do to it. So it's really not, it's not a good idea to technically do treatments on someone who has a really compromised skin barrier. You need to prepare them for that first. If you, if you get that skin barrier back, they're already going to love you because their skins are looking incredible. Then you start doing the treatments that you need to do. Now, this is just a little one that I throw in because I just find it exciting. That accelerates the cement, so cement that I just told you about is basically lipid, the lipid bilayer, okay? So that sits around each and every one of the cells. It's amazing. Its, it's main job is to hydrate to make, make sure that, um, as I said, nothing gets in, nothing gets out. Now, this is um, rele relevant because it comes to whether you're doing mesotherapy or you're doing superficially applied products or you're also doing transepidermal delivery, which you're doing via a needling device or something because this guy will not let anything in that it doesn't know or understand. It's as simple as that. So all these mad and wonderful products and lotions and potions that are out there that are saying that they you know the holy grail of anti-aging, what's in them? And if they don't contain anything that isn't naturally occurring, it's not going to work. This guy is really clever. He's like a doorman of a nightclub. He won't let you in unless you've got a ticket. Simple as that. Now, the caveats to this are, and the important part actually, is the two prescription drugs that are used mainly in dermatology, which is a steroid and a tretinoin. So people say to me, well, okay then, so if it's not letting it in, why is it letting a steroid and it's letting a tretinoin in? Quite easy, what's a steroid? Cholesterol. The steroid is made of cholesterol which we are made of. And it will go, thank you very much. I know exactly who you are. I'm going to let you in. Amazing. What's tretinoin? Vitamin A. Point made. Now, we don't, even if it was a prescription-grade chrysanthemum oil, they're not going to let it in. 
absolutely not. But what this will do is, and this is a bit this exciting or clever, is that it will allow a very good superficially superficial product, a cosmeceutical that has the right makeup of vitamins, minerals, or whatever out we are made up of, it would allow it halfway in so that our, the receptors of our cells will go, oh, hello, no, I need a bit of you. And it will take it, put, pop it into the cell, and the function will kickstart. And over, over time, that condition will calm down. If any of you do things like um, IPL or um, anything that's aggressive treatments, you'll notice that the number one product on the back of their aftercare is copper. Now, copper's a poison. We don't want to put copper in us. But we are made of copper, we have it in us. And one of the first things that kickstarts after a wound healing response or a trauma of any, anything at all is copper. Now we don't want our own copper in, but a, a good copper, again, the right molecular weight that sits on top of the skin is gonna kickstart our natural reserves of copper, which will speed up quite dramatically the wound healing response. So technically what I'm trying to say here is when you're doing anything that becomes comes to trying to um, help someone's skin condition, because we are thinking of the skin as an organ, not as an individual condition. So to put it simply, I don't treat someone, oh, they've got acne, they've got rosacea, they've got dry, oily, T-zone, T-zone, T-zone means McDonald's, and all these various different conditions. I'm thinking of the organ itself. What is wrong with that organ? And how can I fix it? What is lacking inside it? And then guilt by association, those treatments will then subside because we're working as the organ as a whole, the 360 approach, superficially, medial, and deep. Now, skin aging, of course, we know all of this, and this is the one thing that everyone talks about a lot, but it's quite cool because we've got this one here. We've all heard the expression or the stories about um, chronological aging, like you've got good DNA, your parents are really look really good for their age. Yes, that is true, but it's only 20%. 80% is environmental. 80% is what we do to ourselves. So technically, we have an 80% chance or success rate of trying to help these particular patients. So what have we got? UV radiation, sun, dear God, no. We know that sun is bad for us. We, all, we absolutely we do. But we also know it's good in some response, vitamin D, of course, and UV, UV protection, um, is, in, is incredible, you absolutely should use that. Factor 50 mandatory or 30 if you absolutely have to. Um, because UV doesn't just cause pigmentation problems or um, things, awful things like um, melanoma. It does one other thing which is quite frightening. It actually alters your inherent DNA. I didn't think that anything could possibly alter your inherent DNA, but it absolutely does. And that's where you see people who are untreatable because they are, they've just lost all strength to their skin's tissue. So they can't have peels, they can't have filler, they can't have facelifts in actual fact, completely and utterly sun damaged to the point they can't do anything with it. And that's frightening and worrying and it also should be terrifying to lots of people who are massive sun worshippers. So it's your job to tell them I'm not telling you not to go in the sun, but I'm telling you to do it properly. And I won't treat people who don't do this because it literally it's pointless me doing that particular treatment because they're going to go out and ruin it. Heat and humidity is air conditioning, central heating, of course, smoking and alcohol, smoking, absolutely. Alcohol, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. Um, there's no real proven thing about anti-aging versus protocol, to be absolutely honest with you. Um, but if people do drink, then obviously water accompany it. Pollution, we're in a world where we can't get away from that, unfortunately. You see it differently in different countries. You see it even in England, in the Midlands and up towards the north where it's a lot more um, green open spaces. You see a lot less pollution for obvious reasons than you would do in the heart of London. So again, that's understanding. And with things like mesotherapy, we're going to help with pollution because we're putting back all those amino acids that have been stripped uh, by the free radicals. Stress, of course, poor nutrition, absolutely, hormonal changes and medication. So nutrition is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, I'm learning more about it all the time. And I understand that what we eat is, is just as important as everything else we do to ourselves. We know that 
bad nutrition can completely visually show on someone's face. Um, we all know that the lower portion of the face is uh, hormonal, hormonally charged, um, and women have periods, etc. But the rest of the face shows as well. Liver, large intestine, um, pancreas, stomach, everywhere it shows. And you can totally see it up here when you get those little tiny spots but it doesn't come to anything. That's toxin trying to be released. All the things that they've eaten for whatever reason, whether they've, they've got a, a problem with certain foods or the, whatever, whatever it may be. But it's down to you to kind of try and get that out of them and help where you can. I mean, I'm not saying all of us are nutritionists, far from it but it's not particularly difficult to work out certain things because if you're looking at the skin and then you can kind of understand what it's actually showing. Hormone changes, of course, well, we can't do much about that. Apart from I do tell a lot of clients to go and get their hormones checked. In the UK, it's really bad. We all know that GPs don't say an awful lot. As soon as you say ladies' problems, they just go, oh my God, oh my God. Well, they should actually give you a hormone test, a uh, blood test, because it will come back exactly what's wrong with you. And it's not always due to hormonal imbalances um it could be uh, again nutritional it could be something that you're lacking that that could be put back into you and and re restart um, the areas of the skin that are lacking again and of course medication that comes down to whether it's taking it from prescription but also over the counter so things like st john's wort which is awful um and omega-3 now omega-3 is amazing but what omega-3 does is it's, a pho it's photosensitizing so you don't know if they haven't told you they're on it and you do a treatment they go extremely red not a problem it's not going to hurt them but it's just telling you that that, that it is photosensitizing and it does make the skin inc incredibly red post-treatment so with me we're looking at two options here when i'm looking at the client so there's a great picture coming up which will totally show you so we're looking at primary and secondary. So um, no disrespect to clients out there, but most of the time they're wrong. So what they're looking for or what they're showing is usually not really what they, what's actually there. So the primary concern, they may be coming into you that's fine lines and wrinkles, but you're looking at them going, oh my God, your skin's like the Sahara Desert. So I'm not going to bother with your lines and wrinkles because they're there because your skin is so dehydrated. So you would, you would target dehydration and to get their skin back to peak fitness, your secondary diagnosis then would be fine lines and wrinkles. So you're looking at the different variables and how you can work it out. Now, this is an amazing picture done by a doctor from PhilMed, Ricky Smith, who's absolutely amazing. And this, this client is someone that when I saw this picture for the first time, I kind of went, DNA is not much you can do. Now, I was wrong completely. So she'd been to medics who'd said, the only thing that we can really do with you is toxin. Now, that is not correct. So what Ricky did, which is amazing, is look at that person's skin and go, no, you don't need toxin. Your skin is insanely dry. It's like the Sahara Desert in there. We, what can we do with this? We need to restructure your, your matrix. We need to get that HA back in. We need to get all that sexy skin. That's three treatments later, and look at the difference to the right-hand side. That's purely done with injectable um, mesotherapy cocktails, HA, and a good home care in three treatments. Now, she's more than welcome to have toxin. But the amount of toxin she will now need is so minimal in comparison to what she would have done at the beginning, and it wouldn't have looked anywhere near as good. So that's exactly what I'm saying about the primary and secondary. So a lot of people would automatically jump on the bandwagon of her and write, okay, toxin, let's go, and maybe appeal. No, completely different because we're looking at from the inside. What is that skin showing? It's showing unbelievable dryness. It's sun exposure, it's DNA damage. But by doing what, by creating the inside out, we've got that skin back. She's got her skin back, she's, she's made up. I spoke to Ricky about this and it was an incredible result. Now, combined treatments we're looking at now, so we've got the peel, stratocorneum, skin prep, technically, but good peels would also help with regeneration as well. You have mesotherapy, so that's a product implantation. So that's implanting the various minerals and vitamins into the skin. We've got needling, which is technically collagen induction. And we've got the mask, which I always put on because that helps with soothing, calming. We can also put back any hydration that's been lost through the trauma that's been done prior. And LED, which of course is amazing.
Um, so let's start with the first one. To those that know you, I'm a little bit obsessed with this. So mesotherapy is 100% intermolecular transport and communication. That's its job. So it's tiny, tiny micro injections that are placed inside the skin, HA, vitamins, minerals, amino acids. This allows these essential ingredients to come in contact with dermal fibroblasts and give the beneficial effect on the metabolic processes. So the treatment um, or the protocols that, that mesotherapy are phenomenal for are dryness, laxity, color, surface integrity, skin discoloration, wrinkles of dis different density, 100%. I can completely guarantee that because you're placing all of this stuff inside the skin where it's needed. You can only do so much superficially. We want to place this inside and with the right treatment, the right ingredients and the right application, you can place it in exactly the right area. So they're technically their construction materials are, the, are the, the, the ingredients you're placing in. Where did it start? This is cool, actually. It's been around for a while. So in the 19th century, the first hypodermic syringe was invented. Just after that, it was Novocaine. So that wasn't that long ago that we have to buy it on a piece of wood when we're having surgery. And an amazing man called Dr. Pastura had an idea for mesotherapy via pain management. And he created the French Society of Mesotherapy in 1968 and wrote a paper called The Mesotherapy Versatile Technique and offered it to the French Academy of Medicine. And after an audit on the Ministry of Health in France, this happens in every main country, but the Academy of Medicine classified mesotherapy as an integral part of classical medicine and is taught in medical schools to this day. All over the world, apart from here, of course. Um, so that tells you everything you need to know. It is part of classical medicine. It is taught in medical schools. Yes. It is taught from a pain management perspective um, and now working out towards more of an aesthetic field, but you, we don't, they don't, you don't learn aesthetics at medical school. But what it did is it restructured the tissue, it restructured the skin, it made everything better. In France, if you go to a GP with any kind of trauma, a muscle ache, tendon, anything like that, they will not give you codeine like they do here. They will send you to a mesotherapist who is a doctor who will inject mesotherapy cocktails of various vitamins and minerals etc into that particular muscle and it works believe me dr pastor is here he came up with three principles which are really simple the first one is little so it's various quantities of active substances that can be administered in various cases depending on outcome so that is what are we applying what ingredient or what product are we placing infrequently so that's the treatment times is it once a week is it every two weeks and do we have a monthly program quarterly or even yearly so again this is you everything i'm telling you tonight is completely 100 bespoke completely 100 percent bespoke aesthetic medicine is not built on protocols it's built on bespoke application we're all different in the right place is the precursor so this is understanding your target and treating it accordingly End of, simple. And of course, the number one is C, registration. Um, I'm quite obsessed with this for lots of different reasons, but a C registration means you are completely safe. Um, your, treat, your, your patient is safe, even more important. You know that all of the ingredients that have sat inside that particular product have been tested to get its C, C, C registration. So you know it's the best vitamin A, you know it's the best vitamin C, whatever's in there. And you know that you can sit, you can sit back and know that all of the tests have been done for you. If it isn't C registered, it becomes a little bit of a worry as far as I'm concerned. I'm not saying that nothing can happen, but we don't know. Unfortunately, in this country, with its ridiculous lack of um, guidance on who can and who can't, is that other mesotherapy cocktails, that, and which there are many, will have on the back of the bottle for topical use only. Now, for topical use only, to me, means laying on top of the skin. It doesn't mean needling it in. What's the difference between using a single needle and a needling pen that has 12 of them that go as deep as that single needle does? That's not a topical application. That's implantation. So suddenly, I'm concerned about what's going on inside there. Either it's not going to work or is there going to be a reaction? So again, like I said, with all the treatments we're talking about, with the historical data and evidence, we want this to be attached to our little world as well, to make sure that we know that we have a C registration. 
But let's go back even further. 3,000 years BC, China, Brazil, India, Upper Egypt, doctors uh, practice puncturing the mesoderm before applying ointment. And there's actually this lovely man here, um, Hippoc Hippocrates himself, and this fresco is in the island of Koz, and it's him actually doing that. Now, slight caveat, um, I used to live in, for, in Bermuda for many years, and I, of course I was much younger and didn't know anything about anything and just did everything wrong, so I was burned all the time. But back then we knew no different. I didn't know anything. And the island was covered in aloe vera, and it didn't work. I applied it like they told me to, and it's all snotty and weird, isn't it? It just didn't work until one day, a few years in, a much older Bermudian woman laughed at me and said, Andrew, come here. And Nate and her, I never forget the word. She said, nature is better than, than any of us. It's, more, it's cleverer than us. And I'm like, okay, weirdo. Like, I was a kid, I don't know. I was like, what's she talking about? And she showed me the aloe vera plant and she said, look at the end of it. And it had this needle on the end of it. And those of you who've seen it, it's incredibly sharp. She cut the needle off and she very gently scratched my arm, which I'd burned the previous day. Not to the point of drawing blood or even a scratch. She just technically, now I know, she just abraded the, the stress on corneum. She just abraded it. Then she applied the aloe vera and in front of my eyes, the redness disappeared. Now that is exactly what this hypocrisy did, hypocrisy did back then and what they've been doing in China and Brazil and Egypt for centuries. Now, obviously, I didn't, didn't get into the medical world for many, many years after that. So I just took it for granted all these years. That's what it is. And when I started studying mesotherapy, it all came back. Like, oh, my God. Okay, now I'm getting it. Chemical pills are exactly the same. We all know about the lovely Cleopatra bathing in acids milk, lactic acid. The Greeks and Romans used poultices containing mustard, sulfur, and limestone. And even to this day, they do this. Um, a pumice with frankincense, myrrh, and tree resins were used to lighten the skin and remove freckles. And in Indian women, mixed urine with pumice for skin rejuvenation. Not, I wouldn't recommend that, but I can imagine it would work. Because the pH of urine with the exfoliatory processes of the, the pumice stone, why not? However, 16th century BC is the first recorded peel. And it's in the Abira's papyrus, papyrus, which is there on the right-hand side. It wasn't until the 1800s that Peels made another, popped back up, and it was salicylic acid, TCA, and phenol. Then, again, disappeared since the 1880s, right up to the 1970s, and then TCA appeared again, and, and then again in the late, early 70s, AHAs appeared. Now, that's quite an amazing gap between all of those different things. And bizarre that it's the 18th century that TCA and salicylic were around. Now we all know what they do technically and it's all good but once again with the peel protocols it's understanding what they do, why they do it, how they do it. So we know that lactic, mandatic, tartaric, all of them have their, their responses to do, they know exactly what they're doing. Now the trouble is with the peel world it's so complicated because it's pretty much owned by companies who create their own peel and say that this one's better than this one and this combination is better than this one. Now, that's okay, I mean, not, ju not judging at all, but what they don't tend to tell you is that each one of these acids do have a specific job to do. Each one has a different molecular weight, each one will go deeper, each one will target various cells within the, within the skin. So understanding each one of those individually and then working them in combination can be phenomenal but it can also have a much more negative effect as well. Also, we know that peel strength, i.e. the percentage, is really not that bad, really doesn't bother me. I mean, everyone talks about it. I use 70% and it's the pH. So if you've got a pH of three, it's gonna be incredibly superficial. If it's a pH of four, it's that close to our skin, it could might as well be water. But so you could have a pH of four and a, and a percentage of 80, it's not gonna do much. So we're looking at the pH as well as the combination of ingredients that sit inside it. So we know that the AHAs are amazing. We know that we can use them for very, very for many different things. We have salicylic acid, of course, the only one, which is, tends to be used more for problematic skin, so for acne, et cetera. Then we have the newer peels that come onto the market, which is the polyhydroxy or bionic acid. They love a name, don't they? 
Um, the great thing with polyhydrolic hydroxy acids is that they have a much more clinical backstory or evidential story because they're very new. So it means they have to have a lot more evidence to back them up. Gluconolactone is one of those. Um, gluconolactone has got huge um, trials in relationship to cellular turnover, humectant, antioxidant, increased barrier function, skin clarity and brightness, and redu reduction of inflammation and conditions. So that is my peel of choice when it comes to, to that. But you can use gluconolactone with glycolic, with mandelic, with, with, with lactic. Of course you can, because each one of them is going to do something completely different when it's relation, in relationship to the skin. Phil may do um, pills that contain um, gluconolactone, and they have a, they're, they're wonderful because they're very, very superficial, but you can use them over uh, every two weeks, which is exactly what you want to do when it comes to peels. Deep and dirty is great if you have a client that is looking, who's showing a TCA or worst case scenario, a phenol. But of course, that's a completely different game, but game entirely. But we don't want that. It's slowly, slowly catchy monkey when it comes to skin health. To do it every two weeks is just amazing because you're just, you're just taking off that superficial layer um, and allowing the skin to regenerate itself naturally without strip, 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 strip. Like we said, going back earlier about the growth factors, we don't want to interrupt or disrupt the epidermal or the kerosite growth factor. We want them to continue doing their job properly. Now, skin needling, okay, amazing. Again, because skin needling comes from medicine. So it comes from a condition or a treatment called subcision, which has been around for a very, very long period of time. And it's a, uh, a hypodermic needle, a very large hypodermic needle, which is placed under the area of the scarring and wiggled back and forwards, technically, because it breaks the sinew, which holds that acne scar down. So that sinew is attached to the scar and also to the lower tissue. When you break it, it then lifts the skin up and out. But over time of doing this, what the, what the, uh, the medics were seeing is that the skin became better and plump and happier. And, oh my God, this is amazing. What's going on? You've caused collagen induction because you've caused a wound. Now, of course, we don't want to stick a massive hypodermic needle in someone. That would be bad. But what we do want to do is have the same effect without causing that degree of trauma. So we know that the derma roller came out, we know that the derma pen came out, we know all these different variables on there, which is amazing, they all do their job. But what we're looking for in skin needling is 100% wound healing. So understanding that process is mandatory because if you do it wrong, back in the earlier slide when I said about targeting the, uh, the, uh, the fibroblast, that was the one that was targeted when it came to needling initially. Back in the day, 1.5, blood, drama, guts, pain, ouch, client didn't come back because it hurt too much. Um, we're looking at the wound tender response knowing that repair and regeneration can become flawed when there is extensive or repetitive damage, which means the response isn't going to heal correctly because the body isn't understanding what wound you're creating or it will create a different wound for what you're looking for. So the tissue cannot regenerate and suddenly granulomas, fibrosis. And also wound tissue obviously leads to the replacement tissue, but replacement tissue does not carry the same tensile strength as the original. So you really don't want to traumatize the skin that much because obviously that actually says to you in a weird way that you're kind of regressing a bit. You may be helping in one respect, but you're actually losing the tensile strength of the original, original, original skin. Um, the period of inflammation can last up to two years. So if you're doing the wrong depth for the wrong specific, wrong target, that wound healing response is going to continue for up to that amount of time. So we found out through originally through the extremely aggressive needling when it was roller anesthesia blood and guts we all remember it it was really a painful downtime um the skin would just be swollen and amazing maybe like a week to or so after the treatment once the redness had calmed down but that was basically trauma that's basically the body going into into a wound healing response and you're going to basically wee that out but 
18 months or a year, 12 months, 14 months later, things can start to show. But that particular client is not going to remember that a year before they'd had this particular treatment done. They're not going to associate. It took, it took people years before they did associate that the extreme needling was causing these problems. Think of it as simply as this. You cut your finger when you're cutting up a lettuce or a cucumber. All we care about is the skin's heal. Put a plaster on, the minute the scab forms, all good, life's a good one. Um, scab comes off, brilliant. No, 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 no. You've got at least another year, what, eight months to a year, for that skin to heal internally. And then suddenly, sometimes you can get, I've, I've had clients come to me going, I've got this wart, and it's not a wart, it's a hypertrophic scar. And when I say to them, what, when did you cut yourself? They don't remember because obviously why would they? And then eventually they do. So we're, we're trying to explain this to them. And also in your world, when you're doing needling, are you targeting something that demands an enormous wound to restructure skin? So that will be, uh, again, the, 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 the scarring protocols like um, stretch marks, like um, contracture, hypertrophic or keloid any of those absolutely we need to create a wound to to kick start another one to, to to get rid of that one but with anything else with with collagen induction with pigmentation with acne with rosacea with open pores it is incredibly superficial because that's where these things are sitting and you're not going to get rid of open pores at a depth of 1.5 it's never going to happen ever but back in the day, it was just kind of traumatized, traumatized, and everything will just be marvelous. It doesn't work like that. That's a perfect example. That's acne scarring. And you look at that patient on the left, he's got acne scarring. But it's, I look at that and I'm looking at it going, okay, that's 0.5, that's 1, that's 0.75, um, that's 1.5, that one may be 2. I'm targeting each and every one of those scars individually as it stands on its own. Because they are all completely different. If you just run over that whole face at 1.5, you're going to cause a collagen, collagenistic approach to the entire tissue. So you're going to build up collagen in the good tissue as well as the scarring. So what's going to happen? It's not going to get much better. So that was on the right-hand side is four treatments done by literally targeting the exact response for each particular scar that you have. It isn't, it isn't a one-stop shop here at all. The other thing, just as a warning, with pens and rollers, they're not all created equal. So that, you know, and there's all sorts of stuff going on out there. I, I see on sites about this pen, that pen, whatever. It's the needle that I care about. Pen, eh, it's the needle. So where do they come from? Have they got an FDA? Have they got an, an ISO number? Have they got a C registration? All of those things. I need to know where they come from. And as we all know, October this year, the MRHA are changing all of their medical device qualifications now. Needling devices being the number one. So it now is not called a medical device anymore. It has to be called an aesthetic device and it's lost all of its CE. So, which is really good as far as I'm concerned because it means that the good pens and rollers out there will be sustainable. They will be there because they've never had to worry about any of this because they've already done their due diligence and got their product to the best of their um, the best they can be. The devices we use in all treatments technically. Oh, I've just dribbled. Oh, all down. Oh God, here we go. Uh, needle, mesotherapy, that's it. A needle is the number one treatment of choice for mesotherapy not anything else. We have a roller, um, needling, meso gun, still a needle, uh, needling device, and we have the new, latest, greatest, amazing thing in the world, the nano needle. Now, yes, I just said that you can't use X with Y and Y with, you, you, you can, but I'll explain that in a second. But when we're looking at the individual protocols as they stand on their own, that's how they are individually protocoled in relationship to Mesotherapy being the needle or the mesogun, roller needling is induction or collagen induction, and nano needle is implantation to the right depth with mesotherapy. LED is exciting because you know it's all it's all got a bit mental in the last couple of years, really, hasn't it? Um, but once again, LED's got a huge backstory. NASA couldn't get much bigger than that, could you? Develop LED, light emitting diode that show great promise in delivering light deep into tissue to promote wound healing and human tissue growth. 
It's been done for a very long time. Now, the difference is we have a lot of companies who start throwing in the 85,000 million different colors of LED, and we all know that they don't really do much. So the trials clinically have been only done on two, which are blue and red, and infrared. So we know what blue and red do. We know blue is good for, is antibacterial, it's antiprostatic, it's immuno, immunomodulatory, it's a long big word, it's phenoprotective, it's amazing. So that's tending to be used for more of a acne uh, skin type, whereas the red, the red light is helps with the formation of ATP and the mitochondria. The mitochondria is the, as you probably know, the powerhouse, the battery, the Duracell battery, the Duracell bunny of every cell that keeps it, keep, kicks it starting so it's amazing it helps with anti-inflammatory anti-collagenesis antioxidant amazing then you've got one above that which is infrared which is the most deeply absorbed so they act they act synergistically with blue and red to um, achieve optimum penetration so you see a lot of the uh the really good um devices out there like saluma who has a double fda so these things are really important that when you see companies who spend a lot of time and money and you know how much money it gets to not just to have a C registration, but FDA as well, um, it's a lot of work to because uh, they're proud of their equipment and what it does. And you know, once again, that you can um, ha be happy knowing that your treatment is, um, is going to be uh, good for that particular patient. Um, with wound healing, it's incredible, LED. So people with muscle problems, etc. There's also a, another protocol that adds on, which I won't talk about tonight, but that's hair restoration. And with hair restoration or maintenance, um, infrared and red LED is absolutely mind blowing. Because once again, you're creating a wound but from a very different position. Um, this is a amazing ultrasound image um, of proof again. It's a nasal labor fold injection of a, meso a mesotherapy cocktail. And you can see the difference that you've got before injection, six months later, 12 months without top up and 18 months, the yellow is collagen. So you can actually see that it's actually made, it's got to its peak after 12 months. But at 18 months, it's still better than it was before. So this is what I'm telling you when I'm saying, I want evidence, I want imagery, I want in independent study. And you get things like this, you can't argue with it. So when we're doing our patients for the, the combinations now, putting them together, cellular turnover and communication is your number one. We are checking what we're looking for, what it's targeting, how we're gonna get there. So with rejuvenation is the epidermal technique, which is done with a needle, with a barrel up, with a very um, delicate, um, almost scratching sensation, but it doesn't actually scratch the skin. But you're breaking the stratum corneum to allow that product in. That is the actual true blue 100% mesotherapy. Everyone, especially in the UK, they just want deep and dirty. They want to stab it in, let's make it deeper. No, this is the number one. This will give you your 100% maintenance, the hydration. Like I keep saying, and I keep going back to it, growth factors, growth factors, cellular communication. So these, this product will implant into the areas where exactly where you need it and flood the entire superficial tissue. Then you can go in afterwards with your nano needle and do uh, target work, maybe around the eyes or around the um, glabellum uh, um, or oral commissure, wherever you're looking for. Um, Micro needling. Now, I did bring this up earlier when I, I kind of banged on about it's not mesotherapy. Because of the products I said to you earlier about having um, a, a, non, non, a non CE for injection and they're allowed to use a needling pen because it says for, for topical use only, suddenly they're calling it meso-needling or needling, blah, 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 whatever. Well, that doesn't really exist because I hopefully like you've understood now that we're looking at two protocols. Do they need collagen? Do they need sexy, glowing, gorgeous skin? Or do they need both? If they need both, I don't want to do mesotherapy and needling at the same time because I don't want to interrupt that wound healing cascade which is mind blowingly complicated, and I don't want to upset it in any way. I want it to do its own thing. However, I will absolutely use the right product, product, mesotherapy product, with a microneedling device at a superficial level, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 maybe, 
to run over the entire epidermal tissue to allow delivery of that product into the superficial tissue. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But that isn't technically needling. If you want to do it um, in a different way, you can, but I, I would target it differently. I would definitely do, again, is that client showing collagen inductions? That's great, okay, so I'm gonna do um, needling on this particular client every two weeks um, for two, uh, three or four goes, and then I'll take on the mesotherapy, or you could do needling one week, meso next week, needling one week, meso next week. Um, but if the client is just showing fine lines and wrinkles, needs hydration, needs that glow back, needs um, the skin health back, needs all these lovely things, or they've got like certain conditions like maybe pigmentation, then you can definitely, I do it with the epidermal technique with a needle because I'm quicker, but you could do it with a roll, needling device and just delicately roll over the skin to allow trans, trans epidermal delivery into the skin. So you can but it, it really shouldn't be called mesoneedling or anything like that because it, it kind of confuses the issue between the two treatments because each treatment stands apart, individual, and they both do very, very different things. And if we understand the skin's anatomy, we know that it's, it needs, it doesn't always need both of those things. We're actually, we're, I'm gonna give a caveat there. It does always need mesotherapy, to be honest with you because we are animals and we change four times a year. We need hydration, we need vitamin C, we need vitamin A, we need retinol, we need various things. All of this is in it. So it's like your maintenance. And with, with all of these treatments, which is important, is that we don't do them forever. It's not like these protocols where they say you have to do it once a week or once every six weeks for the rest of your life or it regresses. It's not that at all. With mesotherapy especially, they're looking at four, four to six treatments, you're done. So yeah, um, it never happens because they love it so much. They want to come back for more. But you don't need to do the aggressive, as aggressive as you did the first time. Suddenly you do it every three months or maybe every six months as a maintenance. You just do an epidermal. You just put a superficial application. It's all good. You're just keeping everything going. You don't need to do it. You fixed the problem. But because we are animals and we all do things wrong, drinking, smoking, sun damage, all the rest of it, things are going to pop up and then we address them individually. So what I've popped here is the treatment duration, which we look at as every two weeks. Um, we've got four here, but you can do up to six, depending on what the client's showing. So once again, we've got peel first, so we're gonna move, remove that stratum corneum. I think with every treatment you ever do, you should peel first, two reasons, a few reasons. One, the skin is cleaned, you can see what's going on inside there much better. You've removed that harder, tougher layer, which is incredibly difficult. So if you are using a needle, it will penetrate much better. Of course, if you're using a good peel like gluconolactone, you're going to be getting the benefits of the the the, uh, the, regener the, regener the regeneration properties that come with that. And then, of course, we do the mesotherapy, which would then be the application via epidermal called nappage here, which is wrong. Nappage actually means really deep. Um, epidermal um, application via a needle and then of course you would target if you wanted to the individual areas and then of course the needling I've added a question mark on that one if you wanted to use the needling device as an implant as a, a way of implanting the product that way you can make sure that the, you, it's getting in, it's getting into the right level um, you'd need to learn mesotherapy to run to actually do the first um, treatment I just mentioned but learning mesotherapy is literally the best thing anyone can do because it's so so deep in relationship to the cells and the communica communic communicatory understanding of the of the body it's mind-blowing it absolutely it did a 180 for me when I when I learned it and understood what I can physically do to change it without having to worry about machines and this that and the other and of course finish with LED so what we're looking at, combination targets, cosmeceutical skincare, absolutely. The right cosmeceutical skincare will superficially go deep enough to allow our, our own natural reserves of that particular product that you're looking for to kickstart without question. All of the other things, lotions, oils, and lotions and potions are gonna do nothing, it's gonna be emollient. So we need to have that in place. And again, this is a 360, so we need to work it from all angles because it is an organ. 
I know the skin is technically dead, but it really isn't in some respects. We need to make sure that we're targeting the areas in the superficial um, epidermis as much as we possibly can, because that's going to help with the transepidermal water loss and all of those things, get the skin barrier back. The peels are also going to do that. So if we're dealing with a superficial peel, that's going to deal with the epidermal tissue, again, growth factors. All of this having a response to the lower tissue. Needling, we're looking at uh, continual growth because with the needling, we are going to kickstart collagenesis and the growth factors that are sitting in the uh, stratum ba the basal layer here, which will then communicate with these guys down here. There they are. They will communicate. They have no choice. Remember, they have no choice but to have a conversation with each other. And of course, mesotherapy spans the gambit, to be honest, because that's going to, that has, you know, with, with NCTF and stuff, we've got 59 ingredients of which some of those being natural, we're just going to, the body's going to release, but the, the other ones that it wants, it's going to maintain and hold on to. It's, in, it's incredible when it comes to that. So we need to, we need to understand that um, this is what we're looking for in relationship to um, opening up the, the possibility of protocols, opening up the idea of how we can change, how we can make a difference. So we're looking at honesty. We're looking at making sure that we understand what that client is showing, what they're on, what they are, what they're showing, and what they're looking for could tend to be two different things, um, and targeting accordingly. So I know categorically that if you do these treatments together and in combination, you can actually have the most amazing thing. And to you, it's easier because you're not using masses of equipment, tons of obscene amounts of money um, in in machines that do x y and z no disrespect to machines um but in this instance we're looking at a relatively simplistic approach with more history than all of them put together with clinical research and evidence that goes back for ever and you can't argue with that you literally can't argue with it because we're targeted when we're looking at when you become a very good practitioner what you do is you turn off your this product line told me I can do this, or this product line told me that this, this and this and this added together will do this. No, 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 I don't, I don't listen to any of that. You're listening to the organ, you're listening to the skin because it's the one that's telling you what's wrong. And it's your choice and your decision to listen to it. Have a chat with it, that's what I do. And of course, LED takes it even deeper and to the much, the much lower levels, which is why hair restoration with LED is amazing because it takes it right down to where the, ha the, hair, the hair bulb actually is. So that's quite amazing. So we're kind of done now, I bet you're grateful. So to, compl to con con conclude really what we're looking at, the skin is astonishing. It's situated at the edge of the, edge of the body, it protects us from the, and connects us to the outside world. It is familiar yet mysterious. And science is showing that the closer we look at the skin, the more we find out about ourselves. And there is so much more to explore. It's far cleverer than any of us and will fight you when needed. So let's all respect, revere, understand and appreciate.